Good. Well, welcome everybody to today's CIPD um, webinar, which is an employment update, as you know. So we're looking at some key uh, case law and legislative changes. We've got a really good um, uptake, of an uptake of attendees. So thank you very much for attending and I do hope that you find it useful. Um, I'm happy to take questions and hopefully there should be time for questions. As you know, we're going, schedules go until 1.40. If you have any questions, um, then again, in the chat box on your control panel, um, and there's a separate uh, question uh, pane. So if you want to ask any questions, jot them down. And if we have time, then I will look at those um, as we go through. Sometimes I have an able assistant, but here I'm on my own. Um, so I'll do my best to look at those questions and um, answer them. Uh, my name's Catherine Daw, uh, and I'm the head of the Bracers um, employment team, and I suspect I've seen quite a few of you before, but as I say, welcome to this um, session. We're going to cover today things to expect in 2023. Quite honestly, I cannot believe that we're almost at the end of April. Um, in my mind, we're still in February, but uh, apparently we are in April. Uh, the things I've picked up on today are those that I hope you will find interesting and useful um, and where I can I will share our experiences um, and our suggestions. I thought it might be useful to start with an employment tribunal update because it is relevant to not just my day-to-day -day work but I appreciate to your day-to-day -day work as well. Um, I will go through some of the key employment stats but um, really gloss over them. You will be sent copies of the slides so you'll have all the, all the references is in there and um, we've got the King's coronation coming up um, I got really confused the other day and when I saw something in the paper that referred to the Queen's sister being involved in the coronation and I thought well I, I don't know who that is and I suddenly realized we were talking about Camilla it just shows how um, stuck in our minds um, the, the Queen was and um, so King's coronation we're going to cover and a short reference to holiday pay we will be looking at some of the key pieces of legislation, so particularly the harassment bill um, and the flexible working bill before moving on to some of the key case law decisions. So we've picked out some of the recent cases um, that you may or may not have seen. We'll add our, or I will add our commentary where we can and then moving on to looking at um, some case, cases to look out for um, for the remainder of the year. Hopefully that gives you a good rounded view, but as I say, any questions, um, give me a shout uh, and um, hopefully I will um, be able to answer those. So, as I say, I wanted to look first of all at employment tribunals. Um, they are still, if I'm honest, the bane of our lives. Um, waiting times are still really significant. And so I've given you on that slide the average waiting times right back from 2008 up to March 2021. And then we'll look at um, some of the stats for outstanding cases. So you can see the increase um, in waiting times up to first hearing. And when we're talking about a first hearing, um, that might not be a first liability hearing or final liability hearing might be um, a case management type discussion. I keep being told off for referring to it as case management discussions because they don't exist anymore. But you know what I mean, those preliminary hearings, closed preliminary hearings that are for case management purposes. It's fair to say, as I put on the slide, that there are significant regional variations. The majority of our cases, for obvious reasons, are in the London South region, so Croydon um, and Ashford. Um, and unfortunately, we do have some fairly significant waiting times. If I give you some of the stats, um, so stats from December 2022, show that there were 50,000 outstanding cases um, compared to 40, 47,000 in December 2021. Um, there are more claims being dealt with, but nonetheless, those, uh, those um, claims are still, there is still a significant backlog. Um, so it's causing us real problems. I think our current estimate is that issue to final hearing, obviously it depends on the length of the hearing, um, but we're still having average waiting times between, as I say, issue and the final hearing of a minimum of a year, but more likely 18 months to two years. We are we absolutely have got cases listed into 2024 and it's causing us really significant problems. So my guidance to you, if you are um, facing a potential employment tribunal claim, 
in anticipation of those very significant waiting times would be to get as much evidence as you can as early as you can we are preparing witness statements earlier than we would have done previously we're getting disclosure earlier just because of that the problem of the delayed hearing date we're not waiting until the tribunal directs us to do it we're getting on with it uh, because of the risk of losing that evidence of losing witnesses um, and not having the evidence recorded I thought it might be useful for you to look at average tribunal awards. I'm always interested. Um, so unfair dismissal awards 2021-2022 um, statistics show that the average award for unfair dismissal was around £14,000. Um, the top compensation award was £228,000 in a race discrimination case, so clearly very serious um, case uh, and average claims are in the, in the sort of 30,000 mark. So we have seen um, there has been a slight drop off in the level of compensation but still meaningful levels. I thought it might be useful for you just to refer to the CVP. So CVP is the cloud-based platform that the tribunal is using. You can see um, that still a significant number of hours are being spent on CVP. I had my first in-person preliminary hearing a couple of weeks ago, first preliminary hearing, um, in-person preliminary hearing since pre-pandemic. It was thrilling, I'll be honest. Um, it was lovely to be back in tribunal um, in person. Claimant, absolutely delightful, told me I was a lovely lady um, so that all went all went well moving on to some of the stats that we've got thought it would be helpful as a reminder to look at vento bands minimum wage so as you know our vento bands are the um, measures for injury to feelings awards the injury to feelings awards in the vento bands um, are given there so we've got our um, our lower band our middle band um, and our upper band so at lower band um, that, that cusp between the lower band and the middle band um, are where the majority of injury to feelings awards sit uh, in our experience um, and um, the uh, upper band are those that are um, are those that are not not commonly seen but you've given us uh, i've given you their uh, details of those awards um, employment tribunal rates have increased so i've given you those there i'm not proposing to go through them in any particular detail but they're there for you um, should you want to refer to them and then similarly we've got a uh, national uh, minimum wage uh, parts and again um, they are uh, they are there for you to um, look at Moving on to the King's coronation, hurrah, um, and the bank holidays that we're facing, we're still getting a reasonable number of queries about how to deal with the additional bank holiday. And I therefore thought it would be useful to cover it. I appreciate that in um, some of our uh, other updates, we've covered this, but hopefully you'll, you'll bear with me in covering this again if you've already seen it. As I say, I wanted to cover it because we are seeing so, we're getting so many questions um, about this and therefore I thought it might be uh, a useful reminder. Uh, as we know, the uh, additional, the coronation is on Saturday the 6th of May and our additional bank holiday um, is uh, on the um, 8th of May. Arrangements in terms of bank holidays obviously vary depending on the contract terms. So our contract is the first place we'll go to look at whether an individual is entitled to um, have that bank holiday. As I say, I've given you the common contract terms that we see. Um, so the uh, contract terms um, one, two and potentially four will be those terms that entitle individuals to um, the time off. Some specify as per five the number of bank holidays um, and in those circumstances individuals are unlikely um, to be uh, entitled to additional time. Um, it's probably worth referring to or referencing um, what you did for the Queen's coronation um, and what the arrangements were there that can be um, a useful reference point and might be something that individuals rely on um, if they are uh, if they're seeking to argue that there is that entitlement so we have two common questions one are individuals entitled to insist on having the day off and the second pay arrangements um, so if there is no contractual um, no limit on the number of um, bank holidays that individuals are entitled to be paid for um, and if they are required to work potentially if there's a higher rate of pay for that 
that uh, that day, um, then the, there is likely to be an obligation to pay at that higher rate. Um, but uh, if there is a specific limit, so if we refer back to the contractual clause um, five on the previous slide, if it's that type of arrangement, then um, payment is uh, likely to be standard pay and, and not extend to our additional and special um, bank holiday. I've given you um, on the next two slides standard arrangements for requiring individuals to, um, if you want individuals to take leave, um, so if you want individuals to take it from their existing holiday entitlement, uh, then uh, statutory notice can be given um, at the standard arrangement, may be varied by agreement, but standard arrangement is uh, at least twice the amount of uh, days that the individual wants to take off. So in this instance, two days. Um, we've obviously suggested give as much notice as possible. I appreciate we're really close, really close now. Um, so it may not be possible to give uh, a significant amount, but um, if you do want individuals to take holiday on that on that additional day, then notice is required. And as I say, I've given you the standard position, which you will all be familiar with. I wanted to flag whilst we're talking about holiday, the government's consultation on Harper versus Brazil. So you'll be familiar with the Harper case, particularly if you work in education in the public sector or who, uh, if you have a part year worker. So Harper Trust um, was a case that concerned a peripatetic um, music from memory um, teacher uh, who worked part year, so a term time contract, and her holiday was calculated on the basis of the amount of time that she actually worked. Um, uh, and she brought a claim as a result of that. The conclusion of the case, as you'll probably be aware, that her holiday entitlement had to be calculated on a full year basis, even if this meant that she would actually be entitled to a proportionately greater amount of holiday than her full year, uh, her full year colleagues. Um, so that's the current position. There was a consultation, so that closed in March, government consultation. Uh, on changing those arrangements and potentially making holiday proportionate to the amount of time that individuals actually work. Moving on to our two case updates. So we've got the harassment bill and um, looking at flexible work. Some quite interesting pieces of um, legislation that are, that are coming out. So we've got the worker protection amendment to the equality bill. Um, so this uh, has come out of, or, or I suppose is linked to is a better way to say it, um, uh, some concern around there being insufficient protection for harassment under the current equality bill. So there used to be greater protection um, for instances of harassment. Um, and in this instance, we're talking about um, harassment by customers, by third parties. We're not talking about harassment by members of staff. Um, you can see, as I've put on the first bullet point, that the current law prohibits employ employers from harassing their staff and obviously uh, employers can be vicariously liable for harassment uh, that is carried out by their employees. Um, I've referred already to, to the case of um, Unite and Naylard. Um, now this is a case that as I say is, is relevant background to this, um, to this bill and the proposed change. Um, now we've got uh, in this case, the claimant was a regional officer. There was a complaint of bullying and harassment by branch, so lay officials um, uh, who were not obviously employed by the union, but were um, uh, officials of Unite. Uh, the claimant raised a grievance um, about their treatment of her, and she was offered a transfer to another region. It was in the Heathrow region, um, offered a transfer. She brought claims of uh, sex discrimination and harassment. Um, and um, it was found in that case that the Equality Act as currently drafted does not cover third party harassment. So as I say, previously there was um, some coverage um, for two or more instances of harassment complaints could be brought, but, but as, as currently drafted, um, it doesn't. In 2018, as I've said, the Select Committee carried out an inquiry and there was concern raised about um, the protection uh, and uh, therefore we've got the current bill that's under consideration. As I say, it, it's an interesting piece of legislation and I've um, sought to summarise some of the main provisions there for you. So it creates new legal liabilities for employers um, and I've included the draft definition there so an employer will be treated as harassing let's call it an employee here, um, if the employee is harassed by third parties, so 
specifically clients and customers, but, but third parties during the course of their employment and the employer fails to take reasonable steps to prevent that third party um, harassment. Uh, now, you will already be familiar under the Equality Act with the reasonable steps defence. So uh, the defence that an employer will say that they have taken as much action as they possibly can um, to prevent the harassment uh, and therefore they shouldn't be liable for the vicariously liable for the conduct of other employees. And we're looking at a similar test here when we're talking about um, the reasonable steps. So uh, and it will be a defensive. An employer can show that it took reasonable steps to prevent the third party harassment of its employees. The common things that we're looking for when we're thinking about that um, defence are obviously an effective uh, policy and procedure, so effective equality statement. We're definitely looking at training um, and then uh, reactive responses. So has an employer reacted appropriately when harassment has been alleged? And I'm anticipating that there'll be something very similar here. Um, employers are normally able um, in most cases to establish an effective policy and procedure and hopefully a reasonable response to um, any complaints that are raised. But the biggest gap that we tend to see is the training issue. So ongoing training. Um, a lot of employers don't have sufficiently good records. So they might have done training on induction. Um, it might be covered uh, on some um, updates, but um, they can't necessarily prove that individual employees have attended that training. Their records maybe aren't as, uh, as good as they might be. We are anticipating that, um, uh, assuming that this is fully enacted, that there will be a far greater emphasis on training um, and that individuals uh, will be, uh, and that employers rather, will be looking to train um, individual employees on in how to deal with those harassment issues as they arise in the workplace. Um, and that's particularly the case because they're uh, is not just this duty, but there's a potential of an uplift on um, damages uh, in the event of successful claims. So it's quite, um, quite interesting, uh, quite interesting legislation with an absolutely definite focus because of this reasonable steps defence on proactive prevention rather than reaction. I've given you the stage that it's reached, um, so we're midway through uh, its enactment, um, and uh, yes, we will, we will see what happens. Second piece of legislation that I wanted to highlight for you um, is the uh, Flexible Working Bill. Um, I've given you the current position there that no doubt you'll all be familiar with, so uh, minimum service requirements, uh, changes requested, We've all seen a large variety of changes requested, but commonly that will be changes to working hours relating to time or location. Um, there is a statutory code of practice that hopefully uh, you will be, uh, again, uh, familiar with. Um, employer's obligation to respond to requests um, within, uh, respond to requests reasonably, consultation or rather meetings have to take place with employees uh, and employers are obliged to respond to the request within three months, a limit on one request in 12 months, although um, many employers will commonly consider more than one request. Um, I think it, we are all realistic that we need to be very flexible um, about requests that are made um, and therefore uh, in order to retain the good employees that we have. The Government sought consultation 2021 on this uh, right to request, on the right to request flexible working um, and uh, there's some interesting feedback that came back. Uh, the consultation concluded at the end of 2022 and the government committed to enacting the measures that came out of that consultation process. So what does it do, as we've said on the slide? Um, it removes the requirement for employees to explain their application's effect on the employer. Um, I think this is probably a helpful step. I think we've all seen flexible work requests that include that requirement. Um, and sometimes employees are at a little bit of a loss as to how to answer that effectively. It's quite a difficult question to answer. My experience is it doesn't particularly give helpful information. I understand the reason why it was included. It was intended to make sure that individuals were realistic about the request and the likely impact um, on the wider workforce, their colleagues and on the employer. But uh, nonetheless, um, in my experience, it doesn't 
tend to give that helpful information. So potentially that will be removed. Um, there will be an allowance for two flexible working requests per 12 months, a requirement to consult. So rather than just the meetings, which I'm sure for the vast majority of employers will have been a consultation meeting with the employee, with employees making such requests about how to go about um, their uh, how, how, how they will, how that might work in practice. But now there is a formal requirement to consult um, and then there is a reduction in the deadline from three months to two months, which hopefully is sufficient. Um, I have to say, in my experience, the majority of flexible work requests are dealt with well within that three month period. Um, quite often there is an urgent need why somebody's making a flexible work request changes in childcare arrangements, et cetera. Um, and, and three months is a really large amount of time when you're in that situation. And therefore, I'm hoping that um, it shouldn't cause employers too much of a difficulty. The government has similarly announced um, or indicated that this will potentially be a day one right, so removal of the service requirement. And we'll obviously have to see, uh, have to see how that how that goes and, and, and whether that's enacted. And again, I've given you the, the progress of the uh, of the bill and where that is. So moving on to the good stuff, good stuff now. Um, as I say, I've pulled out some of the cases that I hope will be helpful for you. So some of the recent cases um, and where I can, I'll give you my thoughts and guidance um, on the implications for these cases. Some of them are, um, some of them are indicative cases, a sort of flag, and some of them give us some quite practical guidance. The first one I wanted to look at is this um, Western Sussex University Hospitals case. It's a 2022 case, so it uh, is a little bit old now, and not one of the more recent cases that I want to cover. Um, but it's an issue that does come up, and certainly I deal with it on a reasonably regular basis, and therefore I wanted to highlight it for you. Um, so the factual basis for this case is that the doctor concerned was the Associate Director of Transformation. Obviously, we're talking about um, an NHS trust. She was a very experienced doctor, 30 years service. Um, and as part of her role, uh, she was tasked with improving race equality and chairing the trust's uh, BME network. A number of allegations, so 19 in total, um, allegations were made against her, um, one of which was that she told a manager that he was everything she despised in a white manager. There were also allegations that she bullied a colleague because of her sexuality and breached confidentiality in relation to a grievance um, process. A disciplinary process uh, was commenced and the outcome was a final written warning. So 19 allegations, final written warning, um, and as I say, related to allegations of bullying, harassment, etc. CQC, so Care Quality Commission, carried out um, an inspection more broadly um, and concluded that um, bullying was a problem at the trust. Uh, there was additional support, given additional support um, in the sense of a, a trust, another trust came in to help. Um, and the new trust chief executive looked at this issue in particular, the case concerning this doctor, um, and felt that she was not a fit and proper person to lead on equality issues, given the outcome of the um, previous disciplinary process. As a result, she was invited to a second disciplinary process, a second disciplinary process based on the same circumstances, nothing particularly changed other than a change of view, new leadership, fresh eyes. Um, and that's why I wanted to highlight it for you. Um, there is a common view, uh, and it's correct in the majority of cases, um, that it's very difficult for uh, cases to be reopened um, where there is, uh, where there's already been a determination um, in this case, it was determined that the unfair dismissal claim would not succeed, uh, so it was uh, it, it wasn't fair to reopen the case. Ultimately, the doctor was dismissed. It was not found to be an unfair um, dismissal. She was not able to challenge it on the basis that the case had already been concluded and the employer wasn't able to go back. Next case, Luton Borough Council. There's a little bit of a theme, I promise it's a uh, coincidence, um, in that we've got a couple of cases from Leicester, where I'm from, um, and then we've got Luton Borough Council, um, which is in, near where I live now. Um, so we're talking about a, a Luton Borough Council case, 
uh, one of a, a couple of cases on disability discrimination. Um, disability discrimination is one of the most common uh, tribunal claims that we deal with. I'm sure it's the case for a lot of other firms of solicitors. Um, in this case, the individual suffered from depression and arthritis and evidence indicated that he had moderately severe depression, symptoms, lethargy, excessive sleep, um, difficulty with social interaction, lack of motivation. So um, it has some quite significant um, adverse impacts on him. There was a restructuring process, part of which individuals were required to apply for new roles, so a common, common approach. The in adjustments were made for the individual, so he was given additional time and support to complete applications, um, but a part of the process, key part of the process, was an interview, and he didn't feel able to attend that interview. Um, he uh, said that he was not fit for work as a result. The employer went back to him to clarify when he might be fit for work. So you can see that uh, from the employee's perspective, um, he either wanted uh, the employer to remove the requirement for him to attend an interview or for the process to be delayed pending you know, him being um, fit to attend. Um, the employer didn't uh, think that either of those adjustments um, could be accommodated. A deadline was set, missed, and ultimately the individual was um, dismissed for redundancy. Um, and he brought a claim uh, arguing that there had been a failure to um, make reasonable adjustments, reasonable adjustments um, being that he didn't have to attend the interview. He could have just been slotted into um, one of those po posts. Now, the factual conclusions don't particularly help us, if I'm honest, in general terms, but I wanted to highlight some of the EAT's wider observations. So the factual conclusions were that um, the individual's non-attendance at the interview was not to do with his disability, but was because he had a view that the employer was trying to get him out and this was the means by which he could do it. So it's very fact specific. That probably doesn't help us. Um, but the EAT did um, observe, which is the point I wanted to highlight for you, that while slotting the claimant into a role, not requiring to go through an interview, would have alleviated any disadvantage. Um, their view was that it would have affected other potentially redundant employees. Um, if there'd been a delay in the process, it was acknowledged there would have been a wider impact um, and therefore it was not felt to be reasonable in the circumstances. So that is helpful guidance. It's a, um, a reasonably common situation. I have found individuals either for pre-existing conditions or because of the um, difficulty of the process don't feel able to go through um, a redundancy process and that potentially delays matters for everybody else. Helpful guidance in this case. Um, the next disability case I wanted to highlight is the case of McQueen. Uh, it's a claim arising out of uh, dis alleging discrimination arising from disability. Um, so the definition, as you'll be familiar with, is that an employer treats an employee unfavourably because of something arising in consequence of their disability. Um, and the, uh, the employer cannot show that the treatment is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. So we're talking about the objective justification defence. In this case, the individual had um, dyslexia, symptoms of Asperger's, um, some hearing loss, and he had difficulties interacting with his colleagues. So the medical evidence um, indicated that when confronted with stressful situations, um, with the situations likely to generate anxiety or conflict, he would raise his voice, he might stand next to his colleagues' desks um, and um, speak quite loudly, and his mannerisms were suggestive of aggression. He had um, some unfortunate interactions with his manager, one of which reduced her to tears, allegations that he'd been um, aggressive and um, action was taken as a result. He alleged that he'd been treated unfavourably because of something arising from his disability, but it was found ultimately he did didn't succeed uh, because uh, it, it was concluded that his conduct didn't relate to his disability but it was because he didn't want to be told what to do and he had a short temper. Um, now it's the reason I wanted to highlight that case for you is to um, emphasize that it's really important to look in a lot of detail um, to get as much medical evidence as you can about uh, when faced with allegations of um, disability discrimination to have as great an understanding as possible about the reasons for particular um, behavioural and particular uh, issues that individuals are relying on.
The last three cases that I wanted to highlight for you, existing cases, before we um, briefly look at some cases to watch, um, uh, is the case of Earl Shilton Town Council. My dad used to be a uh, teacher in Earl Shilton. That's not why I've included it. Just a little bit of extra information for you. Um, and this, uh, again, is a discrimination case um, and concerns the provision of toilet facilities. Um, so the individual worked in a council building that was uh, situated in a church, church also hosted a playgroup obviously you've got children you've got parents you've got visitors um, and the women's toilets was used well, was used by the um, playgroup and, and individuals attending um, if uh, female members of staff wish to use those facilities then they needed to check for safeguarding reasons that there were no children or no um, playgroup uh, users um, in there before they could use the facilities the alternative was a cubicle in the men's toilet. Um, I think it's the first time I've seen in, in a tribunal judgment the reference to a trough urinal, uh, but it warranted, it, it meant that female members of staff had to you know, go into the men's toilet. They wouldn't know until they opened the door whether somebody was using it or you know, if they'd used the cubicle coming out, they wouldn't know whether somebody was there. And they argued that that amounted to sex discrimination because of the toilet arrangements that were, um, that were in place. Uh, they ultimately did succeed in their claim. It was the tribunal found self-evident that uh, on a robust and common sense basis, uh, individuals would uh, find that to be a, a failure to provide appropriate facilities and it did therefore amount to sex discrimination. Um, again, I wanted to highlight this case um, because I can understand why, because of the restrictions on the building, you know, I'm sure that the um, council thought it would do, was doing its best to accommodate um, in the circumstances in which it found itself, that was not found to be okay and it did amount to uh, a discrimination claim. Last two cases, um, one on age discrimination and the other on fire and rehire. Um, so I will quickly look at the age discrimination case because I want to spend a little bit of time on the fire and rehire because it's been in the press so frequently. Um, now we have uh, the, an individual who was made redundant just before the point at which he would have been entitled to enhanced redundancy uh, payments. So you know, was made redundant just before his 55th birthday. Um, initially, he, he brought claims of unfair dismissal and age discrimination. Initially, he succeeded in his unfair dismissal claim, but not his age discrimination claim. Went to the EAT um, and the EAT looked and said, well, the reason that um, that you've not followed your normal procedures, have rushed this through, um, is because uh, of the additional costs that would have been incurred had he hit that age threshold um, and the case has therefore been remitted um, to the uh, Employment Tribunal to look again at justification. So we touched earlier um, on objective justification requirements and this is a case that we'll look at that in more detail. So definitely one um, to be looking out for. But as I say, the last um, existing case I wanted to look uh, at before we go on to um, see uh, before we go on to flag up some of the uh, cases to look out for is this uh, Tesco stores case um, an interesting case I think it's interesting um, because it uh, concerned an enhancement so a group of distribution workers uh, Tesco wanted them to move from one location to another didn't have the contractual right to do that it was therefore agreed that they would retain their enhanced benefits if they moved and it was set out in a number of different communications that those would be retained for life now there would be circumstances in which they would not be retained if people were promoted went into different jobs, made redundant, etc. But nonetheless, if they remained in their same role, they would remain, retain those benefits. Um, in 2021, Tesco announced plans to remove that enhancement um, and uh, looking at a process of um, dismissal and re-engagement or, or fire and rehire, um, or in the alternative, payment of 18 months benefits as a, as a compromise arrangement. Um, in this case, it was found that Tesco were not entitled to follow that fire and rehire process and because they'd given those very specific um, assurances that the benefits would be retained. Um, so it is um, it is a fact specific case I accept but I wanted to highlight it in the context of this hire, uh, sorry, fire and rehire um, coverage. Um, there is obviously consultation and the potential for that to be removed. Currently it is still a legitimate process but this case sort of limits that a little bit more. 
Before we go on to uh, the uh, the cases to look out for, let me just, I'm just going to scan through um, any questions. Um, and if you want me to answer a question whilst we still have time, so we've still got five minutes left, um, then I will do that before I'll conclude with a roundup of the cases to look out for. Um, Yes, so I'm looking at a question at Harper versus Brazil, which is, I'll be honest, a horrifically complicated case. Um, obviously, we've touched on it. Um, what is the recommend? The question is, what is the recommendation for calculating holiday for staff on zero hours contracts? Um, unfortunately, I can't offer you any guidance other than you need to strictly apply um, the provisions of the working time regulations. Um, so those uh, obviously look at an individual's um, entitlement in reference to weeks and it sets out the methodology unfortunately the current case law says there's no real in, there's no real alternative to going through that those um, calculations um, in practice what are clients doing um, some are still um, approaching the issue on a sort of rolled up holiday basis so they are calculating holiday per days that are carried out and they're paying that at the conclusion of uh, a block of work. So if it's individuals who are on a zero hours contract through a block of work uh, and then they finish, they're calculating that holiday, treating each of those blocks as potentially termination and um, calculating the holiday at that point. Others are doing their best guess. So if it's somebody that works regularly throughout the year, but just you know, there is a bit of fluctuation, they're doing their best guess of entitlement at the start of the year and then doing a reconciliation, reconciliation either towards the end of the financial uh, holiday year um, to see whether they need to top up, obviously sufficiently far ahead so that there is the possibility to take additional holiday or they're doing it at parts during the year. So um, I'm not sure how helpful that answer is. It is unfortunately a very complicated um, area, but there are some practical ways of doing it. And if, if you um, want to talk to me some more detail in some more detail, then by all means, um, give me a call. OK. I don't think there are any other questions. And um, so I will move on um, before uh, concluding in the last three minutes to three cases that I wanted to um, flag for you. Um, again, Leicester City Council, I am a Leicester girl. It's just a coincidence that it's on these slides, but uh, I wanted to flag the case of Rooney um, because there has been a lot of very good, very helpful coverage on supporting um, women going through the, people going through the menopause um, in the workplace. We have done a Menopause Matters uh, series of workshops that they are, they're still available on our website if you wanted to um, have a look at them. But this case uh, looked at the menopause and menopausal symptoms from the perspective of disability discrimination. It's a case that's going back to the tribunal uh, and um, definitely want to uh, look out for. We are confident that there will be some developing case law in this area. Um, and then we have uh, the oh, next case on holiday pay. Oh, it makes me feel tired, as I say, just thinking about holiday pay. Um, we've not just had the Brazil case, but we've had a series of other cases that you will be familiar with that have caused huge amounts of confusion on how to calculate holiday pay. Um, will this case, again, one to look out for because it looks at whether gaps of three months or more between um, holiday periods uh, means that individuals can't go back and link a series of argued unlawful deductions. Again, a really complicated area, but definitely one to look out for uh, in that it has been relied on uh, to a fairly significant extent in arguing that there is a limit on the amount of time that uh, the, the period over which an employee can go back when looking at unlawful deductions for holiday pay. And then our last case that I wanted to flag for you is this Angard staffing solutions around agency workers, um, which looked at whether there could be preferential treatment for, for permanent employees over agency workers. Um, so obviously agency workers have the right to be informed of vacancies, but could there be um, uh, a preference shown to permanent staff? So I put the date down there, anticipated date. So due to be heard in the Supreme Court in December 2023. Um, so an interesting case and hopefully one that uh, will provide us with some useful guidance.
So that concludes uh, today's webinar with a minute to spare. It is my gift to you. Um, I hope you found that uh, a helpful roundup uh, and um, do join us again uh, in future sessions um, and I hope you have a lovely afternoon.